Let's go back in time. Let's go back, jump in a time machine, and go back to 2001. So 2001 was the year that I had my first experience with real-time news. And back then, I was in college. I was studying abroad in Santiago, Chile. And I was communicating with my friends back home via Hotmail. <laughs> and I was talking to my friends in Chile with this. This is all still burned in my brain because everybody had that ringtone. And it truly feels like from another era, only 2001. And this is what news on the internet looked like. Very much just like a newspaper slapped up on the web. So I had my first experience with real-time news because while I was studying abroad, I got my first real journalism job at the Associated Press in Santiago. And one day I found myself at a press conference uh, in possession of some pretty big news. It turns out that a pediatrician in Chile had been sent an envelope full of anthrax. So those of you who remember the weeks after 9-11 know that people in the United States, the news media, politicians had also been receiving envelopes full of anthrax. But this was the first time we had heard about anything like that happening outside of the US. So it was big news. And as I stood there taking notes with my pen and paper, which is not how most of us do it this, uh, in this day and age, but there I was, I realized here I am in this press conference. I'm the only member of the English language media here. And I'm the only one who knows about this news. So for a young reporter, that was both an exhilarating and a little bit of a terrifying realization because I was new to this game. And I realized I had to get this out accurately, and I had to get it out right away. So I ran back to the office on foot, and I told my bosses what I knew. And as they sat kind of lurking over my shoulders, softly urging me to hurry up because New York was waiting, I filed my first 200-word dispatch for the Associated Press, and it went out over the newswire. So back then, that was my first experience with what felt very real-time to me. But it's very different than how we think about real-time today, because the whole thing for me probably took a few hours, two or three hours. And not to mention the people who actually consumed that news probably got it the next day in the morning paper. So how might this have worked in 2014? Well, first of all, I would not have been the only person in possession of that news. The pediatrician herself might have even posted about it on Facebook. And maybe a friend of a friend of a friend would have been a reporter and noticed that news and broken it that way. The government agency who held the press conference probably would have streamed it live online over the internet. And they maybe would have skipped a press conference altogether and just put the news out on their Facebook account or their Twitter account. Hoaxes would have started sprouting up. People would have been claiming anthrax envelopes all over the country online. Major news media would have all taken the opportunity to blast that news straight to your phone all at once. And the whole thing would have been accompanied by a lot of lively debate and discussion online. So when looked at in that context, 2001 feels like truly a different era because a lot has changed. The internet has fundamentally transformed and disrupted the news. And I'm lucky enough to have had a front row seat to a lot of this transformation. I've worked at the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal as an editor, in latter years really focusing a lot on social media and mobile journalism. And now at Facebook, I lead a team that is focused on how news evolves on our platform. So I've seen a lot of this disruption and transformation. And as much as the news media has changed to meet these new challenges, we are also still kind of operating back as though it was 2001. Because we're still, a lot of the surface, a lot of the changes have been on the surface. And we still have a lot of the same old paradigms that are uh, changing the way that we function. So has the news media changed enough with the internet? I'm going to say no. What's really different? First, let's focus on that. What has actually changed? Well, it's very tempting to focus on the fact that everything's a lot faster. In fact, a few years ago, The Onion was sure that the natural next step after the 24-hour news cycle would be the 24-second news cycle. Luckily, that hasn't come to pass just yet. But you know, I actually think that speed is a bit of a red herring. Yes, everything can be faster. But it's more about timing than it is speed. And it's also more about democratization. The real thing that has changed today is that anybody has the ability to report the news and distribute the news. It's been completely democratized. You only have to look at these two images, one from 2005 and one from 2013, of a crowd waiting for the new pope to spot what's changed. We all have the ability to report 
and distribute the news right in our pockets, almost at every time. We're living in a mobile social world. And of social media, the news is a really important part of that community. According to Pew, half of people use social media to post and share news articles and content. Almost half of them use social media to discuss the news on a regular basis. So it's a community water cooler situation. And a full 11% are submitting their own eyewitness content. They're acting as reporters themselves via mobile devices and social media. And of social platforms, Facebook is really dominant. This is a chart showing the referral traffic to websites from all the different social platforms. And Facebook is just incredibly dominant, which is one reason why I wanted to come there, because I truly feel that the audience is on Facebook. And yet, in media, we're still, we're still spending a lot of time using social media to talk to each other, and not enough time talking to the audience. So let's take a look at the old news cycle. As illustrated by my story in 2001, it's very much one to many. A reporter would tell the audience what she knows. It was pretty linear and predictable in terms of how the story would unfold. And it was defined by expert gatekeepers. It looked a little something like this. Reporters learn of the news. News organizations break the news to the audience. Maybe you get a second day story with some more context, expert interviews. By the third or the fourth day, the opinion journalists would start to weigh in and try to persuade you to come to one side or another. And by the fifth day, you probably hit peak interest from the news media, and then we'd be on to the next story. But the internet news cycle is fundamentally different. It's participatory. Everybody is involved at all times. Anybody has the ability to, take, to participate. It's nonlinear because, because of mobile devices and social media, you, you don't know when or how somebody is going to come across the news. And it's unpredictable in terms of whose voices are going to be amplified and whose voices are going to matter in the debate. It's no longer uh, gatekeepered by experts. And this is what I think the internet news cycle looks like. Notice it's no longer an arc, but a circle that continues to feed itself. So first, news tends to bubble up these days on social media. Then the media will officially work to confirm that news. Everybody can participate if they want to, from reporters to sources to your Uncle Fred and your college roommate to Oreo Cookie can get in there and start talking about the news we've seen. Um, news tends to come to us through our feeds these days, through social media, your Facebook feed, your Twitter feed. Uh, and at some point, it's going to start to really take over. If it's a really big story, shenanigans are going to start to happen on the internet, and people are going to start hoaxing. And then at some point, even the people who have been way too busy or just not interested enough in the news to follow the story are going to say to themselves, you know what, I better tune in. I better figure out what's going on here. And sometimes we forget about those people who come to it late. So let's take each one of these and figure out how we can change the paradigm, how we can truly start acting like this is the reality of 2014 and not the same old habits that we had in 2001. So if news is bubbling up on social media, which it does a lot these days, then we need to be sourcing up in social communities just like we do for a flesh and blood community. We need to approach social media as a beat. And when you have a new beat, what do you do? You read everything you can about it. You go, you figure out who the experts are, who you need to talk to. And you start having lunches and dinners with them and getting to know them before there's ever news to break, because you want to have as much context as possible about the story. But too rarely, we do that in social communities. I think there's a, sort of an outdated feeling that there has to be a little bit of distance between reporters and, and their community. And I think if we break down those walls and let reporters be human on social media, then they're going to have a lot more context when these stories bubble up. They're going to know who's important, who's always crying wolf. And they're going to be able to really harness these stories a lot earlier and be able to tell everyone in much better detail what's going on. Because so often these days, citizens are driving media interests. It starts with the citizens, and it bubbles up to us. So it's much better to be somebody who really knows your beat on social than it is to be a parachute journalist coming in right when something happens and not really knowing what's going on or how to evaluate it. And we also should use social media more to just tap into the zeitgeist. I mean, the internet is this vast database of human experience. And it's all there at our fingertips. And actually, at Facebook, we recently created a product um, where you can see what's trending on Facebook, which is a pretty interesting way to see not just what's spiking right now, not what is breaking, but what, what is like sustaining the conversation around the country. What are people really interested in? And I hope that more news media looks at this and, and uses it to inform what kind of stories they do. So at this point in the cycle, the media will officially confirm the news, which is still a very important function, because as we know, 
Not everything that happens on social media turns out to be true. But again, we're still acting a little bit like we're in that 2001 paradigm where you know, your audience only heard the news from you, that you had to tell them what was happening because they sure, surely couldn't have gotten it from anywhere else. And in fact, that's absolutely not true. They're not operating in a vacuum. And I see too many news organizations still, you know, they work and work and work to confirm a story that's kind of been out there for two hours already. And then once they've confirmed it, they send you, this is what happened, instead of moving that story forward. When in fact, I might have already heard about it from a multitude of other places. I already know what happened, but tell me why it matters or tell me what the latest is. And as part of this, you want to respect the mobile home screen because this is how so much of us are getting our news for the first time these days. And you know, we see at Facebook that the mobile push alert is an incredibly engaging way to get people to come to your app. But if it's overused or if they feel out of control with what kind of information they're getting and how often, then they might even delete your app. So Circa, uh, which is a mobile news agency that I'm a big fan of, does a great thing in which they allow a reader to choose what kind of mobile interruptions they want to get from them. If they're really interested in a story, then they can choose to get mobile alerts on that story. And if they're not so interested, then they just check in the next time something really huge happens. So the other thing that's completely changed about the democratization of media is that everybody participates. And this creates all sorts of challenges and opportunities. Uh, and it helps define our role as the media a little bit more, uh, a little bit differently than it was back in the old paradigm. So one way in which we can help is that if everybody is sharing information, if everybody is a distributor these days, you know, they don't always have access to the training that we've had as reporters. There is still something to our training. Um, a good example of this is when Robin Williams passed away, when he committed suicide, the Academy Award uh, Academy Awards sent out a tweeted tribute to him using an image from the movie Aladdin in which he played Genie, and it said, Genie, you're free. Now, I'm sure they sent this out with the best of intentions, and it was shared and reposted hundreds of thousands of times. But what they didn't know, and what those people who were reposting it didn't know, is something that anybody, any reporter who's covered suicide knows, that in fact you run the risk of something called suicide contagion, when you cover a public figure's suicide in a way that implies it's a relief or they've been liberated, um, any way makes it feel, that makes it feel like it's a positive route to take. And this can be really damaging for vulnerable people who might get tipped over the edge. So in this case, the Washington Post, as you can see here, and other news organizations actually took it upon themselves to educate everybody a little bit about suicide contagion. Uh, which was a great public service because, again, we're all out there sharing, sharing information. It's no longer just the journalists. And at least on Facebook, because we chained together related stories, at least this is how it appeared on my news feed. I had the straight story, and then I had the more educational story right below it, which I thought was a great public service. Then you also want to be prepared to always be transparent because, again, we are no longer the gatekeepers of information. If we're writing a story, if we put something out there and the source or the subject of the story does not like it, they have the means to write a blog post and post it to their social channels saying, you know what, this reporter got it all wrong. They misquoted me, they're out to get me, they don't understand the data. And you know, hopefully, first of all, you wanna make sure that's not true. And second of all, you wanna be prepared to, to just be radically transparent, to put the, the um, video transcript of your interview out there, put the written transcript out there. Because if anybody has the ability to, to, uh, to harness the media, you need to be prepared for that. The last thing is you want to amplify wisely. We may not be the only ones breaking the story anymore, but we are certainly have a lot of power to shine the light on important issues. And this is mostly a positive power, but just make sure that you are not amplifying something that is not up to your standards. So feeds, we're getting a lot of news through our feeds, yet I still see the media creating content for an old era in which people are sitting in front of the couch happy to be entertained by your graphics and watch the anchor banter. And of course, this is still a viable model on TV, but it just does not work online, and it certainly doesn't work on mobile devices. You want to get people to stop the scroll. You want to get them to take a few seconds out of their day to watch something that you think is important. And I want to share with you this BBC experiment that they're doing on Instagram, which I think is an extraordinarily effective way to do this. So just in 15 seconds, they've told a story, a compelling story, because they used imagery, no voiceover. They, caught, they went right to the, cut to the chase. 
And this always makes me stop my scroll. I tend to watch this stuff a lot on Instagram, and I think it's a great new way to start thinking about creating content for, for a feed. You also want to be sensitive about traumatic content because you never know what's coming up next in your feed as you're scrolling through there. And as we've seen with coverage of the war in the Middle East or even coverage of suicide, you don't want to scare people. You don't want to take advantage and surprise them. You want to think, of, be sensitive about the fact that you are in a very personal space for them, their phone, uh, and think about putting up some graphic content warnings for that kind of information. Hoaxes always arise for big news. And I would love to see more newsrooms learning how, teaching everyone in the newsroom how to do digital verification. But not only that, teaching your audience too. Because again, everybody participates now. And so you have some knowledge that you can share with them. The Atlantic actually has a great uh, feature they do where they debunk viral hoaxes on the internet and misinformation. And in this case, during the polar vortex last year, everybody thought that Niagara Falls had frozen and this picture was going around. They did a simple Google reverse image search and found out the picture was old. And not only did they tell their readers that it was old, but they taught them how to be skeptical and do that reverse image search for themselves in the future. So this is a core part of what we can do in 2014 as journalists, is debunk misinformation. Finally, let's talk about timing. So we tend to think as journalists that everybody is voraciously consuming the news the way we are, that following every incremental update, sit, you know, hearing the news from all your different sources. But in fact, I don't think that's how most people consume news. And you can see, again, when we think about how much the audience over-indexes on Facebook, that that is not necessarily always a real-time medium. People may be coming to that news very late, a few days, a week, a month into the news cycle. So don't assume they know anything. And Vox Media does a great job with this. In fact, they've premised their entire news organization on the idea that the latest update is not always the most important update. It's telling people why it matters and giving them context and explaining what the importance of the news is. So they also allow this context to travel in every story they do. So if you are just coming to the Michael Brown shooting story, they are going to tell you, help you get caught up. And I think this is a great way to help newcomers be engaged in the news. You also want to use social media not just to talk to each other, but to talk to your audience. Figure out what you haven't told them yet that they want to know. And finally, right to the top of Facebook's news feed. This is a place where people are often coming to get news, and it's not necessarily the latest update that they're looking for or that's most engaging. We see at Facebook that the stories that tend to get the most interactions, clicks, comments, shares, are the ones that answer the question, what does this mean? Why does this matter? What is the background and what's going to happen next? And those are the kinds of stories that you shouldn't just write one time. You should continually write through the cycle of a news story. So some of you may have thought that how to win the internet would have focused on tactics like what time is best to post on Facebook and how many social media accounts should you have. And I could have gone in that way. But that advice tends to go out of date pretty quickly and doesn't always really change the way we operate. It tends to be a little bit surface. So I want you to leave today thinking about how you can truly leave your old habits behind and really embrace this new media landscape that we have. And you just might win the internet. Thank you.